Warning. The views expressed in the following video do not represent the views of the DOD, U.S. government, U.S. military, or Shawshank Emergency Mess and Residency. Case of the week is going to be on submersion injuries. Here in San Antonio, uh, basically summertime is uh, continuing year round, but most parts summer's over. But typically you, during the summertime, you're going to hear, you know, on the uh, turn on TV, you're going to see a bunch of newscasts with a following. Just last month, a young boy in Sterling Heights drowned in the family's backyard pool. The hospital where they died. The pool empty now. Masakit pa para kay nanay ligaya ang pagkalunod ng dalawa niyang anak. Child dies every five days in those. Seven-year-old Kasim drowned in a swimming pool in Andheri last week. Life guards after a little boy died in a Crofton pool. Now on a four-year-old boy who nearly drowned last night. It happened in critical condition after falling into his grandparents' pool. The 18. So you guys get the point, right? We're going to come across this in our um, in our career. So I had a case of a four-year-old female that was swimming at a subdivision pool with a friend of a mother. Um, she was found at the bottom of the pool. The report says that she, uh, CPR was given for about one to two minutes until the EMS arrived. They transferred her to the um, closest hospital, and at that hospital they were able to do a CT of her head, C-spine, and they just gave her basically breathing support. Um, there was concern about her respiratory status and also her C-spine. There was concern for a subluxation. So she was transferred to her local level 1 trauma center, which is where I was at, and mainly just to manage her respiratory issues. So when she arrived, this is what her x-ray looked like. So take a look. What do you notice? Yeah, figures much. Just let me circle these two big areas here. So um, it kind of looks like a case of ARDS, right, or acute lung injury because of the acute onset of these bilateral um, diffuse pulmonary infiltrates. Um, so... When she arrived, now let me get the, the next x-ray, or actually let's take a look at the vitals first. So she had a blood pressure of 136 over 92, her heart rate um, was tacking away 157, rest rate 30, and sat at 89% on room air. She was quickly put on a non-rebreather and she came up fine. But uh, notice the rest rate. So quick pearl, I never kind of trust the uh, vitals that are written down. I usually do a full one count. Uh, sorry, a full minute count of the uh, child's respirations. And when I did this, the kid actually was, you know, uh, respiratory rate around 56. So um, she didn't have to get intubated. We just basically did continue breathing treatment. But she was quickly whisked away up to the uh, PICU. And then um, I went and followed up on her. So her x-ray, uh, about four hours later, you can see that's actually worsening um, of that uh, fluffing out. And, you know, acute respiratory distress sy uh, syndrome, you know, it's... Basically, like this in, intense inflammation that uh, results in, um, you know, diffuse alveolar damage because of all these neutrophils and macrophages are basically um, infiltrating, and it's going to cause a severe disruption of the uh, epithelial endothelial barrier. And usually, this allows for increased uh, vascular permeability. But let's look further on. About even uh, 10 hours later, you can see that it's even getting a little worse. As you notice that there's no endotracheal tube, so she never got intubated. Actually, looking over the record, all she did was get uh, the highest. She was on 40% vapotherm. Um, but here is the one for next day. And uh, not so much worse or so much better, but she never had to get intubated, and she was eventually discharged from the hospital. She had an uh, uneventful clinical course. So let's talk about the definition of submersion injury real quick. So this is from the final recommendations of the World Congress on Drowning, uh, 2002, and they basically just uh, decided that they had a have a following definition that was acceptable for drowning, and it basically is, you know, a process of experiencing respiratory impairment from submersion or immersion in a liquid. Um, other definitions that we should uh, kind of quickly talk about. Uh, secondary drowning, wet drowning, and dry drowning. So real quick, secondary drowning, uh, that can occur uh, anywhere from like 1 to 72 hours after the resuscitation. And really it's just a uh, post-immersion respiratory syndrome, basically the acute lung injury or the RDS that takes place after we've probably discharged them. And it's usually due to or attributed to a loss of um, surfactant or a washout of surfactant. All right, wet drowning and those people who uh, basically have aspiration fluid. And for dry drowning, no aspiration of fluid. And that's usually in 10 to 15% of the cases 
So what exactly are the sequence events? You'll hear buzzwords like Water 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 Ooh, that was a little creepy. Anyways, these are the sequence of events, right? So it usually starts off with some panic and flailing, breath holding, leads to apnea, water swallowing, eventually you swallow or aspirate the water, you lose consciousness, so you asphyxiate, and then you go into cardiac arrest, right? But let's talk a little bit about aspiration of water. So when you read your textbooks, you're going to see, they'll try to make a differentiation between salt water and fresh water. So the salt water, obviously a hypertonic, so if you aspirate this, you know, it goes into the alveoli, it creates this osmotic gradient that, you know, they say that's going to result in the water being pulled into the alveoli, thus resulting in pulmonary edema, hemoconcentration, and hypernatremia. Now for fresh water, a little different, you know, so it's a hypotonic water into the alveoli, and this will create an osmotic gradient as well, but this time the water is being pulled um, into the vascular space, and so they say that there will be red cell lysis, um, Miss that. There'll be hemolysis, hemodilution, and hyponatremia. Anyways, so let's go back to that. Surfactant is what we're always worried about, right? So what happens with the surfactant? Well, if you read your rivers, and um, this isn't the updated version, but basically says that if it's a saltwater solution, it dilutes it, but does not inactivate it. So fresh water is the one that's worse. They say that surfactant is inactivated. Now some of the other review of the literature on drowning. This is from Pediatric Emergency Medicine Practice. All right, this is June 2011, so you can check this out. And this was the evidence-based approach to the evaluation and treatment of drowning and submersion injuries. So basically what was uh, in, stated in here is that surfactant, both salt and fresh water, wash out their surfactant. All right, so let's get down to our ED management real quick. Obviously, you do the airway, breathing, circulation, disability, exposure like we always do, our primary survey. So airway, you're going to you know, consider endotracheal innovation. And if you do um, innovate the patient, you need to think about what kind of vent settings you're going to start. As far as the breathing, how are we going to help them? Can we give them bronchodilators? Yeah, you can treat them just like an asthma patient. But what about steroids? Well, most of the literature that I read basically said that there's no proven benefit of steroids. So that's out of the question. As far as first circulation, fluids, kind of controversial, um, whether or not... You, uh, give them a lot of fluids, tank them up, seeing how they have acute respiratory stress syndrome or acute lung injury. As far as assessing their uh, GCS and exposing them and making sure that we do a good evaluation to, to, to look for any evidence of trauma, because you might have to put them in a C-spine um, immobilization and we'll, or have to take them to the scanner, and we'll talk a little bit about that. All right, endotracheal intubation. If you do decide to intubate, how do you set the ventilator? So remember, we're dealing with ARDS and acute lung injury. So remember, uh, there's really no difference between ARDS and acute lung injury. The only difference is based on the definition of whether or not you get the uh, pulmonary art arterial oxygen and uh, the fraction of inspired oxygen. So basically, it's just a ratio. If the ratio is less than 300, it's called acute lung injury. If it's less than 200, it's ARDS. But essentially, they're the same process. So as far as the original question, which was on what should you use, uh, most people suggest that you use the ARDSnet protocol. And you can look it up online, it's out there. And so basically, this will tell you how to set up your ventilator. First, start by calculating the predicted body weight. Right? There's the formula, and you basically base it on six milliliters per ki kilogram of the uh, predicted body weight. All right, after you uh, get that number, you just come over here to your oxygenation goals. You're gonna set your PEEP and your FiO2. And what they do is uh, they give you oxygenation goals, so you're not trying to basically overload them like you need a PaO2 of 120. You're just trying to get into this nice range, and you're not trying to, you're trying to set them anywhere from 88 to 95%. Uh, so like I said, use minimum PEEP, and then you can do incremental changes to uh, basically meet those goals. Alright, so let's talk a little bit about cervical spine mobilization. I'm bringing TV back on here. I want to show you some video that I took when I was uh, in Hawaii. This is a place called Sandy Beach down here in the uh, corner of Oahu. And they have uh, basically a place for bo boogie boarders. A lot of um, body surfers go out there. And it's got a really awful, dangerous shore break, right? And you can tell it's right there in the sign. So um, basically what this means is that regarding a, to submersion injury is, uh, you know, you have to maintain, look for a history of diving, significant trauma or intoxication if you're going to uh, basically put these people in a sea collar and then take them to the scanner. Um, a lot of the literature basically says that, uh, you know, without a history of trauma, there's really little evidence to support routine cervical spine immobilization. And uh, this comes from the Journal of Trauma. 
So the study was titled Cervical Spine Injuries Among Submersion Victims. This was done by Dr. Watson. And their final conclusion, what they state, is that routine C spine immobilization does not appear to be warranted solely on the basis of history of submersion. And so how did they go about the methodology with this project? So uh, the study was a cohort study. It was done over a period of 22 years, 1974 to 1996, over near uh, Washington State. So let's break this down real quick. So what were the results? So they had uh, 2,244 submersion victims, and they noticed that 0.5% had C-spine injuries, which is approximately about 11 patients. And what they determined is that all these patients had clinical signs of serious injury and had some history of diving, motor vehicle a crash, or a fall from a height. And so they came to the conclusion that basically routine C-spine immobilization does not appear to be warranted. And this is what's uh, commonly um, cited in a lot of the reviews I was reading. So what about our ED disposition? So it's pretty simple, right, in emergency medicine. Asymptomatic patient, what do you do? Usually send them home, you know, observe them for four to six hours, discharge. Now the symptomatic patients, easy, just admit them to the hospital. So like everything in medicine, not everything's uh, black and white and there's this gray zone. We're always worried about this secondary drowning, right? So basically either whether the patient has a is asymptomatic or the patient is mildly symptomatic we're really afraid to discharge them home because we're always afraid that they're going to develop the secondary drowning syndrome that we spoke of right and so we typically err on the side of caution and we admit this patients but what does the literature say about this so where did this even come from so the one that i saw that was quoted the most is this british in the british medical journal it was an article published in uh, 1980 it's called secondary drowning in children and they uh, did some case records and they reviewed 94 consecutive near drowning in incidents. And they found that about 5% developed the secondary drowning syndrome. And so basically their conclusion on this matter was that although it's not always done, all near drowned victims must be admitted to the hospital for observation, irrespective of their apparent relative well-being within several hours after rescue. So that's been kind of the standard care when you read uh, some of the articles. But I was reading some review um, evidence-based review articles. This one's called Drowning and Near Drowning in Children and Adolescents. So a review for the emergency medicine physicians and nurses. And this was in uh, pediatric uh, critical care in 2005. And so what they say is that uh, a completely asymptomatic patient, if they have normal vital signs, oxygen, saturation, physical examination, and a normal chest gram, uh, basically uh, only need about 68 hours of observation in the ED. So I circled the references and I was like, well, let's see where they got this information from. So one of the first studies they quote is from Annals of Emergency Medicine. And uh, this was uh, basically done by Pratt. It's called uh, Incidents of Secondary Drowning After Saltwater Immersion. So this was a prospective study on 52 swimmers. Those 52 swimmers, basically uh, 31 of them were actually released at the beach. And so they were able to follow up uh, them on a, with a telephone call. And what they report is that none of them actually had any uh, respiratory distress symptoms or any secondary drowning. Now the other side of it was they had 21 that actually were transported to the hospital and were admitted. Um, they said basically all who required admission, they had signs of some sort of respiratory stress within four hours. All right, And so they said that no patient developed secondary drowning after an asymptomatic interval. And so they kind of concluded that observation for about four to six hours could effectively screen for those patients requiring inpatient therapy. Now the second article that was quoted was uh, that's cited a lot of the papers I read was this by Noonan and this was a retrospective chart review and it was basically the setting was Children's Medical Center of Dallas and uh, this was 147 charts reviewed right and this uh, comprised all hospital missions after submersion and this was from uh, over a seven-year course all right and so they were their main objective was basically to determine whether or not certain victims of submersion accidents could be managed you know as outpatients so it took 148 um, uh, charts that were reviewed. Now they had to exclude 73 for these reasons, right? They were really sick, you know, they were intubated, they were transferred from another hospital, um, they already had these, some pre-existing neurological condition or uh, pulmonary disease. So that kind of windled the numbers down to 75. But of these, uh, three were direct admits and they had to be excluded because there was they were missing initial medical evaluation. So what this essentially boils down to is a, a retrospective chart review of 72 patients over a seven year period. And so of those 72 charts, 62 were symptomatic and 10 were asymptomatic. But to be symptomatic, you had to meet the fire requir requirements. You had a rest rate greater than 30, 
uh, you had adventitious breath sounds, uh, supplemental oxygen was being used, or the patient just had a was unresponsive, sleepy, crying, combative. And um, of the 10 that were symptomatic, they wanted to find out basically who remained asymptomatic. So of the asymptomatic, 70% remained asymptomatic at 8 hours. Now the symptomatic, basically over half became asymptomatic at the 8-hour mark. Now at the 18-hour mark, basically everybody who was on the asymptomatic side remained asymptomatic. And as far as the symptomatic side, about 3 four, 72% of the kids uh, were asymptomatic 18 hours. So the point to take home is basically uh, regarding secondary drowning, whether you're reading these uh, review of evidence-based medicine from 2005 or the review on drowning that was most recent, uh, June 2011, you know, when you go back to look at the references, you'll see that a lot of the studies, or articles, journals quoted are, are talking about retrospective studies, and we all know the uh, advantages and disadvantages. Just to remind everybody, the main disadvantages is that you know it's difficult to establish a cause and effect relationship, and results are at best uh, hypothesis generated. So when it comes to secondary drowning, um, you know you're going to see and read a lot saying that these kids can be generally observed for six to eight hours if they are completely asymptomatic. But if you have any doubt or if you're concerned, you should admit the patient for hospitalization and observation so that um, we can monitor see if they do develop a secondary drowning syndrome. Okay. Well, uh, that was the case. I uh, hope you enjoyed. This has been uh, EM Talk production. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.